Um, <clears throat> so this afternoon, we are going to it basically try to continue what we started last week. Um, and last week was a kind of sort of recap on the, the, the previous session so that we would get a, a, a concise picture um, and then be in a position to move forward. So most of what we tried to do last week was un, un, unaccomplished. So we will skip back, up, skip back a bit and try to come forward um, with our, our, our understanding of this topic and our study of the matter. Living in the antitypical day of atonement, this would be um, my session number 19. So I'm going to pray and then um, share the screen and get going for the afternoon. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings of the Sabbath so far. Thank you for all the messages, the study and the ministry of your word. And now we come to this important study on living in the antitypical day of atonement. May your people gain the understanding needed for living in this time through these studies in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are going to share the screen and get going. Living in the antitypical day of atonement. And this is my session number 19. Um, the important role of prophecy in relation to our understanding of the sanctuary and the antitypical day of atonement. We'll see the role that prophecy played in the development of this understanding. <clears throat> Such is the importance of the antitypical day of atonement and its associated events, uh, those associated events being the cleansing of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment. Such was the importance, such is the importance of um, these events that a message, the first angel's message based on Revelation 14, 6 and 7 was sent to the world warning of its approach. So, and that occurred um, in the early part of the um, 19th century. In other words, in the early 1800s, um, just after 1798 and the turn of the century. So that was the, an int, a message was sent introducing, calling the world's attention to the approach of this antitypical day of atonement. And since the commencement of the antitypical day of atonement in October 1844, a threefold message known as the three angels messages, Revelation 14, 6 to 12, has been spanning the world, alerting earth's inhabitants to the events unfolding in heaven and on earth, the seriousness of these events and the need to make serious decisions. So a message proclaiming, announcing, calling attention to the approach of the antitypical day of atonement. And now a message during the antitypical day of atonement, calling people's attention, the world's attention to what is happening in heaven and what is to be happening, what is happening and is to be happening on the earth. And we're going to see how important that is to preparing to meet the Lord at his second coming. It is important that we, pre all of this, all that we are doing is about preparing to meet the Lord at his second coming. And yet what is coming out is that we are not going to be properly prepared to meet the Lord unless we carefully study the messages that he has sent um, and understand the work that he is doing now and the work to be done, the, 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 the issues relating to the prophecies, the events that the prophecies predict 
the um the, re the revival and the reformation under the three angels messages that revived the, the 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 doctrines of the bible all of these things are important and the understanding of them and a proper knowledge and understanding of them all of it is important if you are going to make a proper thorough preparation to meet the lord when he comes so I'm going to read um, the three angels' messages. We've said that these messages, one of them, the first, was historically proclaimed. Um, it, its intention was to prepare the world for the arrival of the antitypical day of atonement. And since the day of atonement has begun, that message, along with two others called the three angels' messages, have been spanning the world, alerting the world to the events going on in heaven and the events going on in earth and the events that should be going on on the earth. So these messages then, what we call the three angels messages are encapsulated in Revelation 14, six to 12. And I'm going to ask someone then to read this passage of scripture for us, Revelation 14, six, the 12 as we get ourselves familiar with these messages as they are presented in the Bible. Now, these messages form the basis of Bible study that takes us through the whole Bible to understand these messages, but they are encapsulated in Revelation 14, 6 to 12. And um, we, will, we will benefit ourselves by reading these messages as presented in Revelation 14, 6 to 12 to get a feel of them, to get a handle of them. Someone to read for us. And I saw, and good, good afternoon, everybody. Happy Sabbath, Shirley. And I yes. saw another yes. angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people sing with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. Uh, 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 read it, everything? Yes, read. And, read. Oh, and, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Yes, thank you. Now, yes, thank you this, now. This, this passage of scripture is so important to us. Absolutely important. Now, it is, it is the, the encapsulation of a message that is to span and is spanning and has been spanning the whole world in and giving the warning now of what is um, what's going on and what needs to be going on in preparation for the coming of Christ. The first angel's message, the second angel's message, and the third angel's message combined into a package which, which Adventists call the three angels' messages. This is the foundation of them. This is where they are found in the Bible in a combat form, but the study of them takes us throughout the Bible and uh, they give us an understanding 
of what God is doing now in heaven and on earth and what we ought to be doing in response to God's work in heaven and in earth in this, the antitypical day of atonement. Because someone um, summarized the first angel's message for me, tell me what is the burden of the first angel's message? What, what, is, what is the message? What is, what, is this, what is this first angel saying to us that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people? What is this angel saying to us, anybody? It's the everlasting gospel, the gospel of God's love, the fact that Jesus came, he died, he loves us, and he is coming back again to save humanity, or, well, he's coming back again for those who love him, who obey him and serve him. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, we see that the message proclaimed by the angel is the everlasting gospel. Good. Now, what are, the, what are the elements? Now, if you want to break down that message, what are the elements of that message? Elements or components of the message. Is that we are to fear God. That's one of one's our responsibility. Um, not to be afraid of, but as Ecclesiastes says, um, that let us hear the whole duty of man fear god and give glory to him so we are to love honor respect god and our lives is to our lives sorry are to um give honor and glory to god in everything we do we should be um uplifting god for the hour of his judgment is come so it's also showing a judgment period where we know that you know, we are told that is appointed unto men once a day and after that the judgment, meaning that we have a life in which we have probation and after death, um, judgment will come and judgment simply means um, the giving of the reward of whether we have lived the life of righteousness or that of disobedience and evil, so whichever way it is. When that judgment comes, you will just be given a reward of the life that we had lived. And worship him that made heaven and earth. So one as as the verse, the first part says, our responsibility is to fear God and worship him because he's the creator of heaven and earth. He's our provider. He's everything. And he deserves our worship, our praise, and our love, basically. Good. Thank you. No, somebody else. Um any protect when we read this part that says to worship God as the creator, any particular thing that comes to mind, the, the words that that encompass worshiping God as the creator, fear God, give glory to him, the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Do those words. Remind, of, remind us of anything that is to be therefore involved in worshiping God as creator. The Sabbath commandment. Right, the Sabbath commandment. What, what, what is the connection there as far as you're concerned? The words, what was what, what the connection with the words? Well, in the, in the Sabbath commandment, we were told to to um, worship God because he is our creator and pretty much the same language is used, made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Exactly, the very, almost the same language that is found in the fourth commandment is found here in this call to worship, um, leaving no doubt that the Bible intends us to see a connection between this call to worship and the fourth the Sabbath commandment. Thank you. Now, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Is this talking about Babylon, the city of Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah. 
No. Please. No, what is it talking about? False Christianity. False okay. systems of worship. Yes. Um, specific advocate. Well, yes, go to okay. So Babylon in ancient history was a city built on the river Euphrates. Um, Babylon in modern in the modern spiritual sense is now about false religion, false worship. And specifically this um, verse is referring to what, uh, to who and to what. Verse eight here, when it says Babylon is fallen, what is it speaking specifically about? Who and what is it speaking specifically about? The Roman church? Or a false Protestant Protestantism. Which one? Well, we know that Babylon represents the Roman Catholic Church who has fallen, but then yeah, I think so. Any any further support here? Anybody else wants to weigh in on this? Um Bab what what is the meaning of Babylon here? The meaning of Babylon, I, let me just, this is for my clarity as well, all right? So it has to do with false worship. Um, yes, for sure. Right, right. And it also, it has to do with um, as rejecting of God's truth. So all those doctrines and stuff um, that was being taught, that's against the principles of God's word. Uh, like, um um the sabbath is one where they changed the sabbath from and that came from the roman church who claims the, the authority to be able to change god's times and laws and also they have changed a lot sprinkling baby sprinkling all those kinds of things those doctrines that are not true so that's why i said um babylon of course it has um the, the protest the protestant churches who follow these principles although they're so not supposed to be doing it because they're called Protestants, but they still hold on to the principles of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you for trying and keeping trying. Um, so Babylon now in the modern spiritual sense is primarily about false religion and false worship um, based on the heathen worship of, of ancient Babylon. Um, and Babylon, ancient Babylon was built on the ruins of Babel, the Tower of Babel, which means confusion um, and confusion in a system of doctrine that conflicts, its inner core is conflicting. You examine the doctrines. Now, then we, we are going to encounter a term this afternoon called um, a complete system of truth, harmonious and connected that describes the Adventist message. A complete system of truth, harmonious and connected. Every aspect of that truth fits neatly with every other aspect. There is no contradiction within this system of truth. But a Babylonian system of truth based on Babel conflicts. Each doctrine conflicts with the others, and uh, there is confusion. Try fitting them together; they don't fit, and um, and this is the basis of Babel, when everybody began to speak a different language, and um, there was confusion there. Babylon is built on the ruins of Babel. Uh, Babylon is um, the outworking of Babel. So when we read now, so Babylon in the modern spiritual sense is false religion, religion in which one doctrine conflicts with another because it is essentially based on Satan's original light, which contradicts first, contradict each other. Now, hello? Hello, hold on, hold on. 
Sorry about that. Okay. Now, Babylon, um, first of all, when, when we study it carefully, when we study the history, study the scriptures, we see that it, it, it applied, first of all, to the, um, the Roman Catholic Church. It's Babylon. But Babylon also, also applies to false, false, fallen Protestantism. And Protestantism was um, proclaimed as fallen when in 1844, the Protestant churches, originally they had accepted the William Miller message, many of them, but gradually as the message um, made certain requirements and exposed certain things, the churches one by one and often together rejected the message and those who wanted to be true to the message had to come out of the churches. And so in the summer of 1844, Miller and his associates preached the message, Babylon is fallen, um, primarily in America. And it, this Babylon is fallen is fallen referred to the Protestant churches of America, which had rejected the first angel's message <coughs> as proclaimed by William Miller and his associates. So that is, that is the application there. Um, this message does not does not relate primarily to the fall of the of, of, of the Catholic Church that had taken place sometime before. It is now dealing with the the Protestant churches which had originally come out of Rome but had not given up all their all the false doctrines and now having rejected the message that would have um, helped them to um, go further, advance further in the gospel, um, they are now proclaimed to be Babylon fallen um, because of rejecting that message and consigning themselves to the belief and propagation of false doctrines, the false doctrines of Babylon, um, the, the Catholic Church. So that was um, the second angel's message. It is about the, the collapse of false religion, and uh, not just false religion, but apostate Christianity, Christianity that has um, fallen away from its original purity and is embracing pagan, heathen doctrines, first under the Catholic Church and now also under the originally Protestant churches. The third angel's message, anybody? What is the, what is the essence of the third angel's message as we see it here in Revelation 14, 9 to 12? What's the essence of the third angel's message? Well, I don't want to keep saying, but people are taking long, so I'm going to prevent. <laughs> it has to do with um, the third angel's message is the proclamation of, as, as you said, the, as we read, the everlasting gospel and um, calling people away from, well, sharing the truth at first about the everlasting gospel and the importance of um, the importance of living that life or as someone just said warning against worshiping the beast or false worship and calling people out of that system god's people out of that system of worship to worship him to give honor and glory to him and for me in the end to assuring the second coming of christ all right so essentially as written here in revelation 14 6 to 12 the third angel's message is the warning against worshiping the beast and receiving his receiving his mark and his image and so on and his name in the forehead or in the hand and warning as to what will happen to those persons who receive the the mark of the beast etc cetera, etc cetera. so the the third angel's message is essentially a warning against worshiping the beast 
or his image and receiving his mark in his forehead, in the forehead or in the hand. And it concludes with, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So um, not only does it give that warning, but it also presents the, um, the means by which to um, escape that um, the mark and the image and, and on. And the way to escape is by um, keeping the faith, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, which means that we, um, we obey the gospel. And in obeying the gospel, we exercise the necessary faith that will allow us to keep the commandments of God um, and therefore manifest his righteousness. So, um, that helps us to understand why the Wagner Jones message was called the three angels message in verity, because it presents that side of the message. Any comments or questions up to this point? Okay. Um, okay. Um, if you're going to be speaking in the background, always remember to turn off your mic. If you're not speaking to me, um, better to turn off your mic. Okay, the prophetic basis of the three angels' messages. Notice this then. These messages and their proclamation are based on the study of Bible prophecy. So the, <clears throat> the, the proclamation of these messages was based on the study of Bible prophecy, the prophecies of Daniel, and added to them the, the prophecies of Revelation. But it must also be said that the study and the proclamation of these messages were the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. So the messages were proclaimed based on the study of prophecy, but the study and the proclamation of the message was also um, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, and this is important. One, the time for the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary and therefore the start of the antitypical day of atonement was foretold in the 2300 day year prophecy of Daniel 8, 14. However, this prophecy, along with Daniel's end time prophecies, was to be shut up and sealed, not properly understood until the time of the end. Daniel 8, 16 and 17, Daniel, Sorry, Daniel 8, 16, 17, 26, 12, 4, 8, and 9. These are the mentions of the time of the end in the prophecies of Daniel. Um, Daniel 8, 16, and 17. Daniel 8, 26. Daniel 12, 4. Daniel 12, 4. Daniel 12, 8. And Daniel 12, 9. Um, there's also another mention of the time of the end, but these are, the, these are the, the verses which say that the prophecies would be shut up and sealed until the time of the end, the prophecies of Daniel. And um, we can see as we read that they relate especially to the 2300 day year prophecy. So first of all then, the time of the cleansing of the sanctuary was revealed um, and therefore, the, the beginning of the antitypical day of atonement was foretold in Daniel, in the 2300 day year prophecy of Daniel 8 14, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. However, this prophecy, along with Daniel's end time prophecies, was to be shut up and sealed, that is, not properly understood until the time of the end. At the time of the end, Jesus, who supervised the closing of the prophecies in Daniel 12, appears in Revelation 10 with a little book open, and that book was Daniel's end time prophecies, and that book was open, Revelation 10, 1 and 2. The prophet John, so first of all, the prophecies were to be shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Jesus was there when the prophecies were being shut up and sealed in Daniel 12. And then at the time of the end, Jesus appears in Revelation 10 with 
the book open and he and the prophet John is instructed to take the book and eat it up, study it with the warning that it will be sweet in his mouth and bitter in his belly, Revelation 10, 8 and 9. These predictions were fulfilled in the experience of, experiences of thousands who study the prophecies of Daniel, especially in North America under the leadership of William Miller in the early years of the 19th century. Their studies led to the conclusion that the 2300 day years would end in the autumn of 1844. However, instead of seeing the start of the antitypical day of atonement and the cleansing of the sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary, they believed that the earth was the sanctuary and that Christ would come to cleanse it by fire at the end of the prophetic days. So they, they had a misunderstanding of the event to occur. They didn't see that the, um, that the cleansing of the sanctuary, well, they, they, they saw that the cleansing of the sanctuary would take place, yes, in 1844, but they didn't understand that it was the heavenly sanctuary and not something else that they believed to be the sanctuary. The study and proclamation of the message was indeed sweet in their mouths, but the experience turned bitter when Christ did not appear at the predicted or expected time, October 22nd, 1844. So the, the experience turned bitter after the sweetness of the study and proclamation of the message. Clearly then it can be seen that the Advent believers had fulfilled prophecy in their experience, the study and pro proclamation of the prophecy and the ensuing disappointment. They had fulfilled prophecy, they studied it, um, they took the book, they, they took the book that was open, they studied it and the study was sweet in the mouth. The proclamation of the message resulting from the study was sweet in the mouth, but the experience, disappointment, was bitter in the belly. So they had fulfilled prophecy up to the disappointment. The prophecy said they would study it and it would be sweet. So they fulfilled that prophecy. They proclaimed it and that was sweet. They fulfilled that prophecy of the sweetness in the mouth. And at the end of it all, they suffered a massive disappointment. So that fulfilled the prophecy as well. It was bitter in the belly. So up to this point, they had fulfilled prophecy. But there was more, more prophecy for them to fulfill, to fulfill. Let us pick up the narrative now in the latter part of Revelation 10. So somebody now is going to read Revelation 10 verses 8 to 11. We will read about the sweetness and the bitterness, but then we will go on to see another prophecy to be fulfilled. Revelation 10, 8 to 11. Somebody read that for us, please. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. But thank you up to this point. You'll continue to read, but I'll just make a statement here. So we see then that in the whole experience so far, they fulfilled prophecy, the sweetness in the mouth, but then the bitterness in the belly through the disappointment. Now we are going to see another prophecy which they must also fulfill. Verse 11. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and towns and kings. Good. So that tells us then that after the Um, disappointment. after the disappointment, you, you're reading my screen, you're seeing um, Revelation 10, verse 11 on the screen? Yes. Okay, good. So, um, 
Good. So what the prophecy said, they will study the book and it will be sweet. Sweet in the mouth, so it will be sweet in the study and sweet also in the proclamation. But then it will be bitter in the belly. There would be, there would be this great disappointment when they would expect Jesus to come and he didn't come. Now, we are told that they misunderstood what was to happen. But we will read a passage later on which says that they were not yet ready. Even then, they, uh, notwithstanding the great preparation which they had made, they were not yet ready to meet their Lord and their minds were to be, um, were to be directed to other doctrines, other prophecies, and so on. And this is what we are seeing here. He said unto me, thou must prophesy. So after the disappointment, there were to proclaim another message to the world. Look at it. Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So these, these same people who had gone through this bitter disappointment were to get up again and prophesy before the whole world. They were to deliver another message to the whole world. And what I want to do now is to let us see the connection between this message, this prediction, this instruction that they must prophesy again. We, I want us to see the connection between this and what is written at the beginning of Revelation 11. Understand Revelation 11, 1 and 2 as the condition for presenting the new message that is, that is mentioned here in, in Revelation 11, 11. Revelation 11, 11 says you must present a new message to the world. Sorry, Revelation 10, 11 says you must present a new message to the world. Revelation 11, 1 and 2 gives an understanding of what must be studied in order to present this message. Am I clear? Revelation 10, 11 says, you must present a new message to the world. Revelation 11, 1 and 2 gives an instruction as to what must be studied in order to present that new message to the world. So somebody here, read Revelation 11, 1 and 2 for me, please. The narrative continues as left off in Revelation 10, 11. Now Revelation 11, 1 and 2 continues that narrative. Okay, can I read? Yes, please. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure, measure, measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple live out. And measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall, they shall tread on the foot forty and two months. Good. <clears throat> Do you see the connection between the the direct the, the prophecy of Revelation ten eleven? Thou must prophesy again. Do you see the connection between that and Revelation eleven one and two? What is the connection? Thou must prophesy again before, after the disappointment, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And then what, 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 what happens here in Revelation 11 now verses 1 and 2? There was to be a judgment. They were to measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So uh, there was to be a judgment, it seemed like, the measuring. And, and that was, the judgment would be the people of God. Okay, any, thanks for that. Um, a good start. Anybody else? Good evening. Right. So my understanding is that 
measuring the temple is the beginning of the judgment hour for God's people. The court being left out certainly suggests that the world would not be judged at this time. Okay. Um, okay. Well, yes. Um, interesting there. Anybody else? To anybody else who wants to weigh in on this? Yes, Brother Newton. Oh. I would like to. I am seeing here. Um, oh, go back up to Revelation 11, please. When it says, when it says, um, I am seeing that. Could this be more related to the uh, to the Jewish nation? Because um, I am wondering if the Gentiles were to be, you know, are to be like um, those people who, like those of us who would have who would have act, who would act accepted the message of God on the Sabbath and stuff like that. Um, I'm wondering if this aspect here couldn't be related or isn't related so you can correct me. That's my thought to the Jewish nation who rejected because I'm seeing here. No, 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 no. Okay. I am seeing here um, to measure the temple of God and the altar and that worship therein. Yeah, I guess I see the point that it could be God's people, but then I still, I'm still wondering, can you help me to see that it is not related? I'm going to think a little bit, a bit of, about it some more. It's not necessarily related to the Jewish nation because they had their time already, right? Of, yeah, that 70 weeks had passed. I see it now. It's a little clearer. Mm. Well, um, that's the importance of um, taking your time to, to think about something before uh pronouncing on it um anybody else um yes i was thinking the measuring of the temple of god and the altar and them that worship therein is in relation to the heavenly sanctuary and the work that was done in the sanctuary such as what the priest did and how it would, would relate to what is happening now and what will happen we are seeing this called and it was giving me like giving me a reed like onto a rod and the angel stood saying rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein you are seeing this as an instruction to study the heavenly sanctuary yes yes and that is what it is there was given me a reed like onto a rod and the angel stood saying Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given to the Gentiles, etc. etc. So that is it. Let us spend a little time here and see the connection. What is you read like a rod, Ozzy? All right, we're going to come to that, but first okay. of all, see what is happening first. Brother Newton, Brother Newton, Brother Newton. Yes. The clarity, yes. the light bulb is blowing off. Whoa. So, <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. so here Whoa. it was, right? So uh -huh. they had, so they had, they had, they had, they had opened the book. They had eaten, they had read, and it was bitter. But no, they they were they misunderstood what that whole sanctuary was all about. They thought it was Christ coming um, to the earth because they they misunderstood what the sanctuary was. No, they were supposed to go back and study the sanctuary doctrine in Revelation 1, 11, 1 and two, and still proclaim that doctrine again. Whoa, 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 whoa! Yeah, 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 yeah. Got whoa. it. <laughs> that, that, that down the road must be bright enough. You went with the sun out. You 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 got the place now light up, and that's it. That's what I'm trying to get. That's what I'm trying to say. The angel said, after the disappointment, you have to go back, come out of the disappointment, get over it, come back and study the word of God, and present a new message to the world. And this is what you are to do in preparation for the message. There was given me a read like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying. Rise, in other words, study the heavenly sanctuary, study the temple of God in heaven and the altar and them that worship therein. So you are going to study the temple, you're going to study the altar, 
and you are going to study the worshipers in the sanctuary. So these things you are going to do. And this then, when you have done this, you are going to be able then to proclaim this new message to the world. Is everybody saying that any comments or questions there? In other words, repeat, repeat. At the end of Revelation 10, the disappointed believers are told, you must present a new message to the world. At the beginning of Revelation 11, they are given the wherewithal to present that new message. They are to study the sanctuary. And as Vashi said, then once they begin studying the sanctuary and understanding the sanctuary, it is then that they will proclaim this new message to the world. It is a new message based on the study of the sanctuary, what they had not done properly before the disappointment, they were now to come back and do after the disappointment. And once they had studied the sanctuary, they would be in that position then to proclaim that new message to the world. Any comments or questions? Is there understanding now of what we are talking about? So Vashti, could you repeat what you understood there then? Yes, sir. For me, um, what I understood understand is from Revelation 10, Revelation 10, 11, that that prophecy where it says they must go, they must go again and um, before many people and nations and towns and kings. So they had the children, the million, million, million and those those members, those um, the Christians then they had studied the gospel, they studied the, the word of God in the sanctuary. And because of a misunderstanding that they had on that the sanctuary tradition again, that the sanctuary was the earth, they presented the, the and as we saw above, um, when it talked about, they were supposed to take the book, read it and study it. It would be sweet in their mouth and bitter in their tummy. They had that experience because when they preached about the second coming of Christ, because that's what they thought was going to happen. They were so disappointed. Many people fell off, but others, the, the faithful few held on and the, the, the angel said to them, no, you still got to go back. This is not the end of all things, which took, which calls for courage and endurance and love and patience and everything else, because they, they know they had to take the, what they would have, the, their disappointment and go back and study again and turn that disappointment into an actual uh, victory or gain because they would have on no they would understand the truth about the sanctuary doctrine where the sanctuary is um it is in heaven understand the judgment scenes and everything so that and then they will go back and pro they were to go back and proclaim that gospel on the sanctuary doctrine and the judgment and all those kinds of doc those doctrines that would have been encapsulated in that um, the sanctuary, studying on studying and, and, and understanding the sanctuary. Clear as crystal. Good, good, <laughs> good, good, good. Well, that, that is the thing. Um, to get you to understand it and then to give you the opportunity to articulate. And as you articulate, you will, you will be more fine-tuned in your language and in your thought because the two work together. Language and thought work together. The more you try to speak, the more you must think. The more you think, the better you will get your understanding and be able to use your language. So you're doing yourself a great favor here. And I, I'm thankful to you as well. Um, good. So there was given me a reed like onto a rod and the angel st stood and said, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and the, them that worship therein. So what is this temple that was to be measured? Or studied. Was this temple that was to be measured or studied? Not the sanctuary, Brother Newton, that I just said. Which one? In heaven. Good. The heavenly temple or the heavenly sanctuary. Good. I wanted that to be clearly articulated. So they were to study the heavenly sanctuary or the heavenly temple. Good. And he was given a reed like onto a rod with which to measure 
this heavenly temple or sanctuary. And the question is, what is this read like onto a rod? What are your thoughts? He was given an instruction. He was given a read like onto a rod by which he was to measure the heavenly temple or the heavenly sanctuary and those that worship in that heavenly temple or sanctuary. What could be this read like onto a rod that he would be given with which to study the heavenly sanctuary? What is the, it? The earthly sanctuary. They had to go back and study the earthly sanctuary and what was done in there and compare you got, you, you got to be careful no, not to start a fire down that side because so many light bulbs going off. Um, that would be my understanding. Obviously, is, is the word of God generally, but specifically, my understanding is, I'm saying my understanding, is that the reed, the measuring rod, with which to study the heavenly sanctuary is the earthly sanctuary and its services and those that worship therein and so on. Any comments or questions on that? Well, that would be my understanding too. I think I take, I'm talking a little bit too much, so I'm going to get and keep quiet. But that would be my understanding too, because if they were to go and study, if they had failed in the, in the on their understanding of what the sanctuary was, because they had a belief that it was the earth, God and God wanted them to understand now what the, um, the this sanctuary was, the heavenly sanctuary, in order for them to really understand it. And the rod would be what? It is a measuring, the rod is a measuring stick, which means there was, there had to be something that they, they had to use to see and understand the heavenly sanctuary. So they had to have something on earth so that they can compare this whole thing to if they had to study it. So it would have to be the heavenly sanctuary. All right. Careful. Not the heavenly, the earthly, the earthly. Yeah. So that, I think that's, that might be the rod. But it's what I understand it to be up to this point in time. I, I cannot think of anything else um, that it could be. Uh, of course, generally the word of God, but specifically the word of God as comprehended in the earthly sanctuary and its services and so on. And um, that to me makes sense. And, and, and that is what actually happened, wasn't it? Yes, right, Messiah, um was your questions question was your question answered you want to comment here that it, it sounds good i will have to make sure that it is that but it sounds good it sounds that you are correct yeah um and that's what happened wasn't it How did the believers come to the understanding of the heavenly sanctuary? Well, of course, we know that it was after the disappointment. Um, men like um, Hebron Hudson and F. B. Han and so on um, were going, they prayed. I know they prayed, and the Lord showed them. They prayed, and then the Lord, when they were walking across the Confused, um, Iram had a vision of the heavenly sanctuary, and then they they recognized and realized that it wasn't the earth, the earth that was that is the sanctuary that the Lord was talking about the sanctuary in heaven, and then they got together, a group of them, and they studied and they prayed. And there's where then that they got the understanding, I guess, of the heaven, the heavenly, the earthly sanctuary. They studied the earthly sanctuary, and they came to conclusions also concerning the heavenly sanctuary. Yeah, the essentially um, that was it. Could I ask a question? Go ahead. Uh, let, let John finish first. <clears throat> And we know that when they were studying, and 
the same subject because um, it was close yet. I had written out the study um, during the periods of study. Also, Sister Wood herself, who didn't understand a thing at that time, when they came to parts where they couldn't go any further, she would be taken off in vision and then she would relate the vision. They would understand at the point which they couldn't understand and they would go on further. And that is how they get to understand the truth concerning the sanctuary and all that is involved in the sanctuary doctrine. Sister John, Brother Newton is right, right? Just want to clarify that. No, all she said is that um, it seems so, but she would go and check it out for herself. And that's what everybody should do. Um, that the, to, to see that the measuring rod with which to study the heavenly sanctuary would have to be the earthly sanctuary. And notice, notice the text, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them um, and see that they'll make it after the pattern showed thee in the mount so that it is clear that from those steps that the that God intended the um, the earthly sanctuary to be a teaching model for the heavenly, because that is clearly said in the scriptures. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them and see that they'll make them after the pattern show thee in the mount. And this then was clear evidence that the the the, the earthly sanctuary was intended by God to be a teaching model of the heavenly. Um, Could I ask a question? Yes. The application of the reed like a rod to measure the temple, isn't it the same thing that would be applied to measuring the court, although it was said that it should be left out? That's my question. The um, application of the reed like a rod, measuring the temple of God, the altar and they that dwell therein, wouldn't it be the same rod, read like a rod that measures also the court, which was told um, to be? Right? My immediate answer would be yes, um, subject to review. But yeah, therefore, review. therefore, so it is. if it is yes, it must be that the application of the read like a rod measuring the temple is really measuring those who worship within it. To me, it's measuring the character of the lives that are claiming worship in this temple and the court is left out because the standard by which the temple ought to judge the lives of those who claim to be worshiping therein cannot yet be applied to or will not yet be applied to those who worship in the court to me it is god's church and judgment beginning there first and then those who are on the outside which is in the world are judged after. All right. Um, some some interesting thoughts there. Um, so, and therefore you 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 need to continue studying the Maria system, sir. No, I was saying what Brother Mac is saying concerning also a judgment seemed to be coming out there is in the back of my mind also because um, you know the measuring and. And, 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 and the judgment beginning at the house of God first. And we know that the judgment also vindicate God, his character, and also would cause the sanctuary to be cleansed in terms that the sins, the guilt of the sin that goes beforehand to the judgment from the people of God will ultimately be removed um, by the by Christ, even as he judged the people, his um, people, the people of God, and um, therefore the sanctuary, it will itself be cleansed of any charges of guilt or anything there. So there's where I, I'm thinking too, those were the lines um, around which I'm thinking, and I'm thinking that, that, <laughs> that it read like a rock, and um, represented also the commandments of God, the standard by which, the standard which is used in the judgment. So I'm thinking whether it could be a twofold understanding of the verse. 
um, I, well, no, notice, notice again, um, notice again that it says rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship there. And so, um, it can be the sanctuary, it can be the earthly sanctuary, um, bearing in mind that in the earthly sanctuary, you, you had everything, including the Ten Commandments. So, um, the, 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 so, so you, you don't have to go beyond the earthly sanctuary to find the meaning of the rod, because the, the earthly sanctuary contained everything. Uh, the study of the earthly sanctuary is going to reveal everything. The law, the, the, the Ten Commandment law, the character of God, the, the, the worshipers, you know, everything is revealed through the study of the earthly sanctuary. So, and its services, of course. So, um, no need to go beyond. Once you, once you mention the earthly sanctuary, that covers everything. Okay, um, so here we see then, here we see then that after the great disappointment, the Advent believers were to proclaim another message to the world and as a basis for this message, they were to study the subject of the sanctuary. These prophecies were also fulfilled in the experience of the Advent believers. After the disappointment, careful study of the Bible revealed that the sanctuary to be cleansed was the sanctuary in heaven, and that Christ had moved to the second apartment of this sanctuary to perform the cleansing work. The believers then understood the full significance of the first angel's message. It was to call, it was a call to prepare for the antitypical day of atonement, the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, and the investigative judgment. They then began to proclaim the message as they should have. Great controversy page, pages 409, 411. The scripture which uh, let me see. Um, okay, um, this is, this seems to be quite a bit, um, so it means that, um, we're going to have to come back to it, um, I think I would be going a bit too far if I for read all this, oh, this really, it's kind of the spirit of prophecy summarizing what we said this afternoon and, and put them a particular stamp on it. Um, so we're going to we're going to read this next time. Um, these sections here about a complete system of truth. Um, we're going to read about how they so it, it, it's just basically to summarize the fact that. Um, the, the study of the sanctuary formed the basis for a proper understanding of the first angel's message, the second angel's message, and the third angel's message. The study of the sanctuary provide that, provided that basis for that proper understanding of those messages, and it led then to the understanding and the, the emergence of a complete system of truth, um, harmonious and connected. So we've essentially um, stated that this afternoon. But what we're going to do is come back and reiterate it then next time so that your understanding will improve and hopefully solidify. So we won't go any further this afternoon. Any final Comments or questions? Brother Ozzy? Before we close, yes? Yeah. I will read it now, probably next week, concerning 
the, the, the measurement there, according to what I just read, it represents the judgment, yes, that's what Stoics is. And um, in terms of the earthly sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary comes in, as you correctly said, you know, giving us, which will give us the understanding of what is happening in the heavenly sanctuary. So that's why they had to go back and study that. But the measurement is the judgment of God's people, which is included in the in in, in the sanctuary services, uh, which is really um, very important to the people of God and to the heavenly sanctuary. But I will next week because we gotta finish. Okay. So, um, any other comments? Final comments or questions? So essentially, again, what we are seeing is that um, the experience of William Miller and his followers right there in the early 19th century was a fulfillment of prophecy. They, they studied prophecy and preached prophecy and that study and preaching of prophecy was in itself a fulfillment of prophecy. The disappointment that resulted was a fulfillment of prophecy. And their experience after the disappointment was also a fulfillment of prophecy when they um, went back, studied the sanctuary, and were then placed in a position to proclaim another message to the world. And this is where we are at this point in time living in the antitypical day of atonement, understanding what is happening in heaven and what is happening on earth and what should be happening on earth, we are able to proclaim a message that will help ourselves and others prepare for the second coming of Christ. And um, of course, I had a statement to read which said that the, the believers then could not meet Christ because they were not properly prepared and they were not properly prepared because they did not understand the work that Christ was, was doing and, and the corresponding work that they were to do. And for this to happen, they needed to understand another message um, for themselves, for the church, and for the world. There is no preparation without a thorough and a proper study and enunciation of the message for the time. So, Brother, Brother Newton, a question. As you said that, my thing is, um, is it just because they did not understand? Well, I guess the understanding of the prophecy um, will help them to adequ be adequately prepare for, uh, prepare themselves for the events that were supposed to take place if Christ was supposed to come and then in the proclamation of the gospel. So they couldn't, they weren't prepared because of, I am just wondering if it's, it's just so much their, their, um, their theoretical understanding or it is more of once they understood what the, the, the prophecy, the sanctuary, they would have been able to prepare, um, be more prepared physically to go through what they had to go through then um, before the coming of Christ. You understand what I'm asking? All right, so I'm going to read the statement here. Great controversy, page 440, 424, 425. But the people were not yet ready to meet their Lord. Now, this is the people that had prepared. They had prepared diligently, getting up on morning and praying, putting away sin, you know, making things right with their neighbor, diligent preparation. But they were not yet ready to meet their Lord. Watch now there was still a work of preparation to be accomplished for them. Light was to be given. So what is the work of preparation? Light was to be given directing their minds to the temple of God in heaven. And as they should by faith follow their high priest and his ministration, their new duties would be revealed. Another message of warning and instruction was to be given to the church. Says the prophet who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth, for he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them 
as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Malachi 3, 2 and 3. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of the sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification and putting away of sin among God's people upon earth. This work is more clearly presented in the messages of Revelation 14. They did not, the people who prepared in 1844 did not understand this message and therefore they could not properly prepare. Then we understand the work, it is only as we understand properly the sanctuary in heaven and the work that God is there doing in that sanctuary, only then will, be, will we be in a position to properly prepare. To say that we are preparing, but we are not seeking to understand the message, we are not preparing as God would have us prepare. The preparation is bound up with an understanding of the message and therefore an understanding of the length and breadth and height and depth of the preparation that is needed and therefore being able to apply then ourselves intelligently to the preparation, obviously by the grace of God. Let us pray, Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings of the day. Thank you for the study of your word this afternoon. Thank you for the privileges we have of living in this antitypical day of atonement and understanding the work that you are doing in heaven and the work that you are seeking to do in our hearts through the work of the three angels' messages. May we understand the connection May we make the connection and may we seek to understand the message and understand the work to be done in our hearts. We thank you. We praise you for bringing us to this position and to this particular kind of study. Bless your people. Cease not with us till we gain the understanding we need. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. God bless you. Um...